going perfect. Great. Oh, sorry, one more housekeeping thing as well is obviously as we are recording, um, well, actually, you can't see your cameras anyway, but so I think we're fine in terms of anyone being seen. So that's fine. Actually, no, don't need to do that bit of housekeeping. OK, so I wanted to kick off just really quickly with a bit of background uh, for those of you that might be newer uh, to the campaigning landscape, um, but also a bit of a refresher for those of you that aren't. Um, is that we have been consulting on changes to the Fair Trade Community Scheme for probably just uh, over a year now. Um, obviously, we would have liked that to have been a bit of a quicker consultation, but we were sort of caught up in a pandemic after we started. And so it has taken a little bit of longer than we would have hoped um, to get to the point where we're rolling this out. So apologies, it's a bit longer than we had planned, but we're really excited about what we've done. And we're really hoping that this takes on board all of the feedback and all of the stuff that you've shared with us over the last year to refresh this campaigning space. Um, we have tried to take on board as much of the feedback that you guys told us. Um, we are really aware that the uh, Fair Trade Community Scheme, or formerly the Fair Trade Town Scheme, hasn't been overhauled in quite such a way for pretty much the entirety of its existence. It's had tweaks and updates to the five goals over the years, but this is kind of a bit of a step back, a look at what we need to achieve as Fair Trade campaigners going forward, a look at the landscape around us, how things have changed, and a bit of a larger update in terms of really asking campaigners what they need to campaign going forward, but also looking at the strategy at the Fair Trade Foundation and what producers have told us that they need from us and how they want to see campaigners and supporters show up for them in the future. So we've taken all of that into account when thinking about what this looks like going forward. So as I said, there's kind of three key areas we're gonna talk you through today. The first one is the campaign's action guide and the five new areas um, that we're going to be talking you through. Also the online community space. So that is a hub where you will be able to really easily access uh, your group's information, download different documents and also renew your status and commitment. Um, and then also the case studies and how we're going to be collecting information and data to refresh and share good news stories from the campaign and the network back out to you more frequently. If you want to roll on to the next slide, Sam. Perfect. And then just a reminder that at the end of all of that, there will be some breakout rooms. So if you're able to stay for the last half hour, it would be so great to be able to have a chat with you all, see your faces um, and get the opportunity for you to ask any questions. OK, so let's start with the campaign's action guide. So what's new? Um, so in the past, we have had a um, Fair Trade Towns action guide. That's the thing that many of you have been working from. And for those of you that have looked at it any time recently, you'll know it was incredibly out of date. Um, it's had a few tweaks over the years where we were able to, but in all honesty, it was very, very old Fair Trade brand. It hadn't really been reviewed properly for quite a long time. Also, um, the feedback that we've been hearing from you guys for quite some time now is that either you've met all the goals and you're not feeling particularly challenged or you are struggling to know what to do next um, or the goals have become too difficult as well. So obviously the goals were set up quite some time ago and things like going to your local shops and auditing has become more difficult because of the way that the fair trade model has flexed and changed over the years. So it's not always as simple as looking for the mark on pack in 2023 as it was, you know, 10 years ago. So it was really desperate need for us to update um, an action guide for you guys to know what it is that you needed to be doing as fair trade campaigners. Um, but in having looked at that as well, um, one of the other pieces of feedback that we got and one of the things that we have noticed about the landscape of campaigners um, over the years is that um, the different types of campaigners have grown closer together. So um, actually what we've tried to do is create a campaigning action guide that speaks to everybody. So anybody that wants to take action for fair trade um, is able to look at this guide. And what the guide then does is it breaks down the different routes into campaigning for fair trade. So you might be a fair trade community group or you know, formerly known as a fair trade town. Um, you might be a fair trade school. You might be a fair trade place of worship. You might be a university or college. You might be an individual supporter. You may already be part of those schemes. You may want to become part of those schemes. And the intention of this 
um, action guide is that it is kind of the initial point where you will go to to learn about why fair trade campaigning is important, the different ways in which you might be able to campaign for fair trade and how to get on board with that. So to be really clear, the fair trade community scheme is still a thing in and of itself, as is the fair trade school scheme, as is the fair trade places of worship scheme, um, as is the fair trade universities and colleges scheme. They are all still separate schemes and separate awards. And you can, depending on who you are, you might be involved in two or three of those. Um, and you might also be an individual supporter as well. So they still exist. And the action guide hopefully makes that very clear. But what it does is it tries to show how all of those different groups work together to achieve one campaigning aim um, for a fairer future for trade. Um, so all of this is available to download and, and at the end of my section we will just show you where you can find it to make sure you're really clear on the um, where you can find the guide. Um, so the other thing that we have done in reviewing the scheme is we have moved from having five stringent goals, so the concept of you must meet these five goals and then we will award you a fair trade community, um, a fair trade community award. And instead, we've tried to make it more flexible. Now, in reality, we kind of been doing this anyway, because so many people have said to us, you know, I can't achieve this particular goal. Um, actually, my counsellor doesn't engage or this is a really difficult thing for me to do in my community. So actually, what we're doing now is rather than having stringent goals is we're having areas and these areas are based on the feedback from campaigners about what you know works and what you feel is important at local level. And also what producers have told us they want to see campaigners doing in the UK to drive forward fair trade. Of course, it's also always about um, achieving growth in the market for fair trade as well, fair trade one word. So it takes into all of those things in these areas. And the way that we're trying to position this to all of you is that you can take action in any of these five action areas. So in your um, community, it might be that boosting fair trade or connecting fair trade are areas that you feel very comfortable with. You can see how that would be something that you are able to do in your local area. You have loads of opportunities to do that. Um, but you might, for example, decide that fair trade change maker area is something that's actually more of a challenge for you and something that perhaps you want to park for now, get involved in later, or it's just not going to work in your local community. So what we've done is provided you with areas um, for activity, um, and we have given you some examples of what that looks like, but we really want to hand the power back to you um, to decide what it is that you want to be doing. So just to really quickly reiterate what these areas are, and many of them will be areas that you already campaign in. It's, it's not new stuff. Um, it's really just about repositioning and explaining what that looks like in 2023 and beyond for campaigners. So boosting fair trade is really that consumer ask. It's about getting more shoppers to buy fair trade and more fair trade sales um, for producers to be able to receive that price and premium. Um, connecting fair trade is about getting people into fair trade and working together across groups. So we've talked a lot about how, you know, fair trade groups that perhaps have lost people or are really struggling might work with other local groups in their area. Perhaps there's a, already an environmental group or an Extinction Rebellion group or a Greenpeace group that you could work with. The change makers is that political um, aspect. So. Are you reaching out to your MP? Is that something you can do? It also features the um, council uh, resolution, which has been part of fair trade for a really long time. Like, is that an opportunity to influence uh, council procurement? Ambassadors is about self-education and big picture educating. So we, we really started this with things like the messaging on the climate crisis and really trying to show people how fair trade and trade justice fits into this bigger picture and the values that other people already hold to show them why fair trade isn't something new that they have to care about. It's actually just a really important part of things that people are already concerned about, but perhaps they haven't thought about the role of trade in that. Um, and then influencing is um, really about helping campaigners to bring their campaigning into the digital space. So how can you increase your network and increase your reach by creating digital accounts and doing social media activity? Um, moving on, Sam. Okay, 
Um, so that's a really quick whiz through. I think Sam is now going to stop sharing the screen and do a really quick live demo of where you can find this action guide. I know that mo most of you may not have had a chance to read through it all yet. So we're not expecting necessarily any really uh, feedback on this today. That's OK. Um, if you have time to read it over the next sort of coming months and weeks, we're always keen to hear your feedback, whether that's through our inbox or when we next run one of these webinars for more feedback on this. So Sam, I'm going to pass over to you to do a quick demo, if that's OK. OK. So this is what the action guide looks like. Um, and importantly, it sort of starts with a bit of context setting um, around what trade justice is. Um, but also what fair trade is. So really important to sort of separate the two out. Fair trade, one word, the brand, the mark, the campaigning movement sits within a much broader movement for fair trade, two words. Um, and we talk a little bit about that and about the role that fair trade plays in that, like the value that it has for producers, why it's so important to still focus on the growth of the fair trade mark and sales but also how it's not the entire job is not done with fair trade and that there is far more that we need to do to really bring trade justice to um, producers. Um, and then we go through into the uh, areas. Um, so talking about the different communities, places of worship, and at the bottom of each area, you can see that there is a how to sign up piece. Um, and then, sorry, I'm getting faster than Sam, don't worry. <laughs> I don't want you to go too fast because it will make everyone's eyes hurt. Um, one of the other, um, and then we talk about the fair trade action areas. So if you can just pause here for one second, Sam, because the other thing that I just wanted to point out is um, the other thing that we've instituted, and Sarah will talk a little bit more about this when she talks about the community space, is the opportunity to get badges. Um, so. The purpose of this really is um, for you as campaigners to be able to show the value of your campaigning at local level. So not only will you be able to um, apply and get fair trade community status, but on top of that, by sharing case studies around the type of activity that you're doing in your communities with us, you will also be able to download these badges. Um, so if you're, for example, doing a lot of stuff around boosting fair trade, you can share a case study around that with us. Um, and this is kind of how we're going to generate those new fresh case studies to share back with you. Um, and then we will be able to send you a digital badge um, and you will be able to use that wherever you want to. So if you're having conversations with your council, you can use these badges to show them the areas that you really care about as a campaigning group at your local community level. You can put them on your website. You can use them on your Twitter account. You can use them on your Facebook account. Um, you can place them on any printed materials that you do that are um, relative to your local group. Um, so it really is like, an opportunity to shout about the things that you think you do well um, and uh, an opportunity to start conversations around the areas that you think are important to your local community and that you as a group particularly care about and have a particular skill set in addressing. Um, I think that's more or less it for me. Um, these are the areas that we're coming to now and I've just talked through them. So um, I don't, are we doing a demo on where to find it on the website or are we just going to talk through that Sarah sorry um on that slide that Sam was sharing before it showed that um oh, okay you can, fine you can access it either through the communities uh page or you can go to the resource library uh and then follow the link on the resource library as well perfect okay so I don't know if anyone in the team might want to be able to just pop some links in the chat as we do this. If you can pop a link to the action guide in the chat for people, that would be really great. But also all this stuff is linked in the emails that you should have been receiving. If you haven't received an email from us, don't worry. Um, we captured as many people as we could, but because of the... Uh, you know, renewals not happening, happening for so long with the pandemic, it may be that certain people have been missed. That's not intentional. And if you um, think you should have received an email and didn't, please contact us at hello at fairtrade.org.uk and we'll make sure that we get the email out to you that has all of this information on it for you. And that is me for now. I'm going to pass over to Sarah to introduce herself and talk to you a little bit about the community space. So over to you, Sarah. 
Hi, oh, am I on mute now? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah, the other Sarah. Um, so I work to support a lot of our communities and I'm really excited because for the past year we haven't had an active um, renewals process. So I'm really excited that now this online community space is launched. I can really have an opportunity to get to know lots of you in your lots of different areas um, geographically. Um, and really see what type of campaigning you can get up to and hopefully you'll get to know me a little bit as well um, throughout all this. So I wanted to show you the online community space. What is new? This is um, an online space where you can log in with your password and you can complete an application to be fair trade, uh, a fair trade community group or your renewal to be a fair trade community group. Um, in the past, um, we haven't been able to give you a platform where you can save and come back. So we're really excited that this space, you can log in, um, you can create an application, you can save it, you can come back at a later date, um, maybe after a discussion with your committee and fill in a bit more information. So that is one of the main things that I'm going to be showing you today. Um, after I've gone through, through what's new, I'm going to be giving you a bit of a demo on the website as well, if you haven't seen it yet. As Sarah spoke about earlier as well, we've got the introduction of the digital badges. So as well as being able to apply for your application and your renewals, there is a section online where you can fill in some information and give us a case study for your digital badges as well. Um, you can also download your certificates um, as you've always been able to do from these spaces so that you can get them whenever you need them from any of the applications that you do online. And then just to note that one of the things that we had in our feedback of our consultation um, over the last year or two is that um, lots of people wanted longer in between renewals. So um, it is still two years for when you first sign up as a fair trade community group, but after your first application, it moves over to three year um, in between each application that we would like to hear from you. Um, so as well as this online space, we've also created a user guide, which can be found in the resource gallery. Um, so you can see it here, the very first one, the community space user guide. It's not quite as um, picturesque as the campaigns action guide. It's much more procedural, but hopefully it will support you if you are having any tech issues. Um, and you might want to work through them before you um, email our inboxes. Um, we've got lots of information on there, how to uh, apply for the first time, how to reset your password. We know um, some people may be the leader of their local uh, place of worship account or their local school's account. So it shows you how to create an account if you've already got an account with your email address as well. Um, so that's just a really great piece of information for everyone to read through. Um, so... Sam, I'm going to take over screen sharing now, if that's OK. And I'd like to show everybody my web page. Um, so this is the Community Space User Guide that I've just spoke about. Um, it has links to the action guide, how to apply, how to renew. Um, and I think what Stefan might just put the link in so you can read through this all at your own time as well. So this is all the procedural tech type things like usernames, key contacts, passwords, um, that sort of thing. And I will move on now to show you the community space. So some of you might have seen this already. Um, I've seen, I had a little look today and I've seen that 50 different people have saved and logged on and, um, had a go at their community registration. So that's really exciting that in the last week, some of you had a go. We've had three groups as well who've already completed their application forms, um, which is really brilliant. But for anyone who hasn't seen it yet, this is the community registration landing page. Um, and you can either log in, if you're already a, a community group, you would have received an auto email on how to sign in for the first time. And if you haven't, if you could just pop us an email at hello at fairtrade.org.uk and we can just check that out for you. But if you didn't previously have um, a community group and let us know your key contact, then you can sign up as a brand new group. 
um, by just giving us your first name, your last name, email address, and then just a little bit of information about your group, um, what type of community you are. So one of the things that we really want to keep throughout this is that we know that people are really proud of being a fair trade town, city, borough, village, etc. So all those things still fit under fair trade community and it will still be on your certificates um, at the very end of the process. So we like to know that. And then you just create a password and account. Sorry, I've got that little Zoom bar at the top so I can't see my tabs. <laughs> That's better. Um, if you, yeah, so if you're already a community, you can just log in with your username and password. So you would have got the information for that via email. And once you're logged in, you're, this is the space that you should see. So at the very top, it'll tell you what your group is called. So I very unimaginatively called myself a test group. Um, and then it tells you if you are awarded and when your next. Um, renewal is due and then further down is a place to complete your application it will tell you if you've completed it if it's waiting for us to um, acknowledge it um, or if you've not started as in the case of this one here and then underneath is the brand new part which might be a bit little less familiar to everyone which is the community badges um, so once you collect the different badges, they will appear on here on your dashboard. So you can see that I've done one already. I've become a fair trade influencer. Um, and as you gain them, they'll all sort of populate this area and you can see all the other badges as well. Um, whilst I'm here, I wanted to show you the fair trade community application. Um, so this is what the form looks like. So I know a lot of people might have been used to the older, um, slightly longer form with lots of different um, different parts to the application. Um, I think on average, people have been completing this in around 20 to 30 minutes, if that gives anyone a little bit of an idea how much time to put aside for it. Um, it asks for your um, key information and other group member details. And then we ask some data information. So you can provide us with any links to your Facebook or Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. Um, so we can share that with other campaigners if you wish. Um, and then just a place to tell us about what you've been up to, different media and events. Uh, we'll still be collecting information about your local authorities um, and any resolutions or letters of support you can upload onto here. We'll be asking you as well about your political representatives um, and especially with your constituency reps if you press yes there's a drop down menu you can tell us exactly what constituency you are in and then the main part of this form we really want to hear from you so after we've got all these parts of data collection the main thing we're asking is what have you been up to as a fair trade group since you last spoke to us um, in maximum of 3000 characters. And then also we really wanna know what are your plans for the future as well? Um, these are the two really main parts of this form. Um, and obviously all the rest is really great to find out, but this is the part that we really wanna collect. And when we're creating case studies and really sharing information with other groups, this is the part that we're really gonna be digging into. Um, and then finally, there's an opportunity to upload any um, photos, uh, articles, and then submit or save application. So as I said before, this is one of the things that we're really happy about with this application form. You can save it and you can come back to it later as well, which is a, a brand new feature for us. Um, and then really quickly, I just want to show you what it looks like with the rest of the badges. So you can go into each badge. And it'll tell you a little bit about what it means to have that badge. And then there's just an option to give us some information of what you've been up to and then somewhere to upload photographs as well. And then you can, again, either save and come back to it or select your application. Um, and that is the platform. We'll stop sharing. Thanks, Sarah. No problem. Um is there anything else you wanted to cover in this part or before we go to questions? There's a couple of things that it might be worth just 
responding to in the chat that I've been looking at. Was there anything else you wanted to cover off now? Um, no, that should be all. Awesome. Okay. If we want to do some questions about what we've covered before we move on, that'd be great. Yeah, I think perfect. Um, so um, just really quickly, um, a couple of things that is probably worth saying at this point. So during the consultation, you might remember that one of the things we'd suggested was a really simple renewal process where literally we just asked what, you been, what had you been doing and what did you have coming up? So as you can see, that's still the main part of the form, but we have still asked for a very small data capture. It's a lot less than it used to be that we would ask you for. So there's no like auditing of products in your local area. But the reason that we're still asking do you have any social media accounts? Are you engaging with your local MP, et cetera, is because it's really useful for us to understand what kind of activity a lot of campaigners are doing. So from that, we'll be able to generate an idea of how many people are engaging with their local MP, for example, how many people are running events, how many people are running stalls, et cetera. And what that means is it will help us as a team to prioritize what kind of toolkits and resources we create to support you with your campaigning. Um, so it's just a bit more of a kind of like a, on reflection when we were creating this, we felt like a bit of quantitative data gathering as well as the qualitative case studies was really important for us to have in order to be able to support you going forward. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing that I didn't really mention around the badges is one of the other key things about having the downloadable badges in exchange for case studies is that it means that um, you don't have to wait until your formal three-year renewal to tell us what you've been doing. So in terms of us being able to have case studies that are up to date and more recent and are about things that you know campaigners have done in the last six months, 12 months, people will be able to submit them through the badge portal, like through the um, accessing badges on the community space. Um, and that means that we'll be able to consistently have a rotor of fresh case studies without having to wait until renewals. Um, so it's it's a really great way of us being able to gather information from all of you and then share it back out to you so you can see um, what other campaigners are doing and what successes they're having. Um, we will still do more of the things that we've been doing uh, during lockdowns that you all really enjoyed, like bringing you together into spaces where you can talk about your successes to each other but it also means that you'll be able to see that reflected on the website as well and you'll be able to go and read recent case studies and hopefully it will give you some um uh, some ideas for how you might refresh things in your local area or how you might do things differently or start in new areas of campaigning or activism around fair trade locally to you um and then the other thing that I just noticed was a question in the chat about how do you know when you've done enough to apply to become a fair trade community, whether that's events. So essentially what this change does is because we don't have the stringent goals that you now have to reach to become a fair trade community, you become a fair trade community by forming a, either forming a local group of at least three people and explains all of this in, in the guide. Um, so at least three people into a, a steering group or a fair trade campaigning group, whatever you want to call it locally is fine. Um, or you might be a local group that already exists that wants to campaign for fair trade. So the act of doing that and the act of committing yourself to supporting fair trade in your local community makes you a fair trade community. So you will apply for that through the process that Sarah has described and you will be uh, given a fair trade community status. What then happens is you become part of that community and you will then start to take action. So some of you have been taking action for a very long time um, and you'll continue to take action. And for some of you, you'll be newer on this journey and you'll be taking new actions in the action areas that we've developed and that we hope will support you to know what it is that success looks like for fair trade campaigning at local community level. So I know that sometimes it can feel uncomfortable to go from a, a scheme where there was very rigid goals um, so it felt like you were being rewarded for something to something that is a bit more flexible but the reality is we're responding to what people were finding in their local areas that they were kind of had met the goals they didn't know what to do next they wanted support to understand what to do and they wanted the flexibility to choose to meet certain areas and not others based on what worked at their local community level. So we're really hoping that the changes that we made will empower 
campaigners rather than hold you back and really sort of put the power back into your hands to campaign in a way that you feel is best for your local community um, and bring as many people into the concept of fair trade communities as possible, whatever that looks like for you. Um, and we're here to support you on that journey, whatever it looks like, um, and hopefully create new toolkits and new resources to support you in that going forward. Um, should we open up Q&A? I realised we were going to do one after my bit and one after Sarah's, but I skipped over that. I'm really sorry, Sarah. <laughs> it's following a script and presenting at the same time is really hard, but I think fine if we maybe take Q&A now um, and people can unmute and ask questions. Um, and are you facilitating this bit? Will you chair the Q&A, Sarah? Yeah, happy to. <laughs> Perfect. I can okay. see there's quite a few questions in the chat, but Stefan seems to be uh, really just efficiently replying to okay. so I don't know if anyone has any more questions um okay. they want to maybe come off mute we can have a little look if okay anything... well how about we say if you're a bit nervous and you want to put your question in the chat Stefan will have a go at um answering them and if we don't get through them all by the end of this um we will have a look at the chat afterwards and and try and build that into the web pages where all of this sits but if anyone's feeling brave enough to speak into the space now, perhaps we can stop sharing the screen so we can see people and you can unmute and ask a question if you'd like to. Hello. <coughs> hello. Um, hello, who's speaking? Me or... <laughs> <laughs> this is going to get a bit uh, messy. I think actually you can put your hand up. Um, so if you see uh is it reactions yeah if you see uh down in the bottom of your screen you'll see a little thing called reactions see sarah's raising her hand right now um and if you click raise hand you can put your hand up to ask a question and it sort of it puts numbers by you so we can see who raised their hand first um and then hopefully mm. we'll be able to take questions one by one and if i click on participants we should be able to see who's got their hand up but I can see we've got one, two, three, four, five, five. Oh yeah, five. it's not sh it's not showing me any numbers. Go on, pick someone, Sarah. You go for it. Um, I, I'll just go through the list in the order that they're shown. Um, so Margaret Morrison, if you'd like oh. to. Yeah. Hi. Um, my question is, um, well, I better say where I'm from. I'm from Bearsden, Mogai and Gavin's Mill up in Glasgow, near near Glasgow, Scotland, and uh, I've been a key contact for the Bearsden Mogai group for a long, long time, about 10 years now. Uh, anyway, we've joined in with Gavin Smill, so I'm key contact for them and we'll need to change our name. And I'm also key contact for my church and I've got to have two different emails addresses. And I've already tried to do this through the applications, but it hasn't quite worked. So I'm not quite sure if we have to go from here just to set it all up properly. So will I phone, will I email or what? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've had quite a few uh, people who are in exactly the same case as you, Margaret, so don't worry at all. If you want to drop us an email at hello at fairtrade.org.uk, we can get in touch with you directly. But um, just in case anyone else is also in the same sort of issue, I'll let you know that um, if you're key contact for more than one group, we can you can only log in once with your email but we can give you a suffix at the end of your email so that you've got two separate logins. So for example, if your email was margaretmorrison at gmail.com, the first one might have the name of your place of worship. If it was assuming it was a church sent saviors at the end and then assuming your second one was um, a local geographical area, it would be your email address with them with your geographical area just at the end of it as well. And you'll be able to log into those two accounts separately. But um, yeah, do drop us an email and we can organise that for you. <laughs> that was the part of the problem was that I tried the suffix and I haven't had anything back. And I don't know what I've done wrong, but I'll sort it out. <laughs> yeah, email. one of our team will definitely be able to help you with that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Cheers. Um, Dennis, would you like to go next? Hi, um, I'm Dennis. Uh, I've recently moved back to Redcar in the north of England from Derbyshire, Matlock and Chesterfield. 
Uh, I'm in a very different context here. Mainly I'm involved in local politics through the cooperative party. So I'm not sure at the present time how to start and build fair trade into my agenda for influencing local politicians, national politicians, and also the local University of Teesside. So uh, I'm looking for contacts, I'm looking for ideas from people, uh, and I'm looking for perhaps a new statement of what fair trade is all about uh, in, in the context of 21st century. Um, uh, and, and just feel that there's a need for a debate about uh, the, the, the relevance of fair trade now, uh, as opposed to, you know, I, I should say I've been a development, international development professional for uh, 60 years. So I've been around a bit. Shall I take this one, Sarah? Um, thanks, Dennis. Um, and thank you so much for being here and for asking the question and, and wanting to know how to create local networks to you. Um, so I think the first thing was in terms of like statement about, you know, what fair trade, the value of fair trade in the 21st century, I think you'll find that in the action guide. So I don't know if you've had a chance to have a look at it yet, but that the point of that really is it sort of starts out with a why, you know, what is fair trade? What is trade justice? And why do we need campaigning? Like, why is it important now versus 25 years ago when fair trade first started? So I think that's a really good place to start in terms of understanding how we're positioning that um, in the broader picture of everything else that is going on in the world today. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, um, in terms of ideas for how to get universities on board in your local area, start conversations um, around fair trade in political in the political arena. So as well, we'll come on to this in uh, in a minute, which is the case studies, but we are through the process of having the badges and through the process of people renewing for those people that have had success um, stimulating political conversations in the local area will be collecting case studies that you'll be able to use to have a look at and consider whether that's something that might work in your local area. Um, and then the final thing that we really would like to do is as well as doing an update um, webinar just to sort of get more questions and feedback from you is to actually run separate area separate webinars across the next year on perhaps the next six months that focus on each of the areas. So we'll do one that explicitly focuses on political lobbying and getting people involved in the political arena um, at local community level. And we will, as part of that, it won't just be us as the team that come to it, we'll bring in other people around the Fair Trade Foundation that have the, the most of the knowledge. So we would do that one in collaboration with our policy team. And we have a new head of policy a new head of public affairs that's actually just recently started at the foundation. Um, so he will be able to talk to his vision and thoughts um, for how to influence politically on the topic of trade justice and fair trade going forward. Um, does that answer your question, Dennis? Yeah, that's fine. Um, I just wanted to raise it. And uh, yeah, uh, it's great to see the idea of having future webinars. Uh, I'm involved in an academic society and uh, we've started having them once a month. Um, uh, and it brings in lots of international people and it works really well. So uh, go ahead with that. And uh, I'm right. happy to make a contribution at some point if that was helpful. And conscious of time this evening, but just off the top of my head, I know, for example, that Fair Trade London do debates on fair trade and have been doing them for quite some time. So there are definitely case studies. Um, and one of the case studies, I think, is about the fair trade debates, isn't it, Sarah? So if debates is something you're interested in, we could definitely put you in touch with campaigners that have been doing that that can give you some thoughts and ideas. So. Thank you. Thanks. Um, next up on my list, uh, M.A. Green. Hello, well, it is Martin Green. I don't know why I've only got my initials there uh, from Hartlepool. So I can tell Dennis there are plenty of uh, fair trade supporters on Teesside. Fabulous. <laughs> uh, we've been a fair trade town for, I think, 18 years now. But we came to something of a halt with COVID and uh, really have not really got up and running since. 
what I'm particularly interested in about being a fair trade town under the new regime is how much involvement the local authority has to have to be a fair trade town. It was a sort of compulsory part of the of the system before. Um, should I take this one, Sarah? Go for it. <laughs> yeah, so this is something that we actually spoke about a lot in our consultations. Um, we've got lots of groups who really wanted to keep um, that council resolution aspect as mandatory because we hear that that makes um, councils really need to get involved. Um, but then we also had lots of other groups as well who told us that council resolutions were just something that they could never attain within their groups. Um, so we were in the place where we wanted as many of our groups to be able to call themselves fair trade community groups as possible. So we have kept the council resolutions in the application form. And it is definitely something that we want campaigners to continue doing. Um, but we have taken out the fact that it's mandatory just so that we can keep all those campaigners in who are um, not going to be able to get that um, that support from their local council so they can still be considered fair trade. Um, I don't know if you've got anything you want to add, Sarah. No, that was perfect. Um, we sort of thought this would come up. It was one of the areas that um, we had a lot of conversation about, and we also debated quite heavily on it with the National Campaigner Committee. Um, and even they were quite split in terms of like whether it should be a mandatory ask. I think the reality is if you have a really engaged council, um, in your local area and in fact a council at all because some people just have parishes etc so um, then it feels like something that's really achievable um, and something that is I know for many people they've considered it to be a foundation of the concept of communities but I think it's really important to also recognize that other campaigning is also really valuable and there are some geographical areas where it's much more difficult to get that engagement at, at council level and what we really didn't want to do was to make those those people feel like they didn't have value in the campaigning space or that they couldn't um create a community that supported fair trade in other ways so that's why we've done it how we have um, and we will still be capturing the number of people that have council resolutions and reporting that back to you and you can certainly use that in a conversation with your local council you can say did you know that this many people across the country have got their local council to you know make a resolution for fair trade why haven't you done that that's information and data we can share with you um, if that's something that you want to do as part of your local campaigning i think the, the point is that although a council have a resolution uh with with cutbacks over the last five years say they have much less much less resources to actually put any actual support to the campaign hmm. yeah um <laughs> It's something that we've heard from campaigners um, and, and it's the reality, you know, um, councils have much less centralised funding coming to them, They're having to make really difficult decisions about what they resource and what they choose to work on. So perhaps that might change after the next general election. I guess we'll have to see. But um, yeah, it is, it is the reality right now. It is a really difficult time to be influencing a council. OK, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question, because I know that's one that quite a few people will be thinking about as well. Yeah. Um, moving on, Penelope has been waiting very patiently. Um, <laughs> over to you. Oh, you're on mute, sorry. Um, I can't hear you, sorry. Can we... Are the, oh. Sorry, I, I think we did that at the same time, Sarah. Oh. <laughs> Is that, is that all right? Can you hear me now? Yes. OK, it's Penny. Um, I'm in Ludlow Fair Trade Town Group um, and a church group as well. But I'm just really a very simple question. Um, Stefan has posted quite a lot of really useful links. Will they be um, shared? Because I couldn't write them all down. Yeah, that would be really good. Thank you very much. It was that that was really all. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we'll make sure that um, and when the next or one of the following newsletters goes out, we've got a summary of all these places where you can get all of these. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Um, next up, uh, Pat. Pat Fitzpatrick. Hi there. 
Um, I've got two questions, if that's all right. Uh, first one is, we, um, I've been notified that um, you know, uh, uh, renewal is due the 7th of August. Um, and uh, between now and then, things are really busy. So what happens if you don't make the deadline? Yeah, that's a, another really great question as well. Um, we are going to be really flexible with all of our extensions for the next for the whole of 2023. If you've got an email that asks you to give one this summer, um, just drop us an email and we'll gladly extend that. Um, we're automatically just putting everything to the end of December. Um, but if you think realistically, it might take you another like 12 months to get to that place. Just let us know. We're going to be really flexible. We know it's a brand new online system. We know that lots of groups are in that place where you're rejuvenating. Maybe you've met less post pandemic. So, yeah, um, there's no absolutely no need to be rushing to meet an August or September deadline. If it says it in your email, we're happy to change it. OK, thank you. I mean, I'm hoping to get started soon, but it's just, you know, a question that I just wanted to clarify. Second one is um, the bit of paperwork I have read so far. I haven't looked at it in depth. Um, it said because, you know, we've been a town, a fair trade town since 2005. And it's it, it looks like it's assuming that I've got a login. And, you know, the last applicate, renewal application I did was prior to uh, the pandemic. So I have no idea what that sign-in would have been. Is it so? You know, what does it look like? The, 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 the sign-in um, you're renewing. Yeah. So if you if we recognise your group as um, an existing community group, you would have got an automatic email that said right. "Welcome to the community space." And right. if you scroll down, it would have told you your login username. Right. Um, okay. So it would tell you the email address. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe if you've got a suffix, if you're more than one key contact or if you're, if you've got a church or a school account, it would tell you what your suffix is and it would give right. you three steps on how to log in for the first time. Okay. Um, if you didn't receive that at all, that may, maybe just means that the last time that you submitted an application was a little bit longer ago than we have kept your data. So you mm -hmm. can just get, drop us an email and we can yeah. search our system and see if you're still there and we can get you set back up. And if yeah. for any reason you're not on our database then we can just help you start afresh <laughs> thank you I, I, I mean I'm going to go back in and have a look at it so it's likely that I've just missed that little bit but, uh, so thank you very much no problem thanks for your questions Pat um just looking at the time it's five two now so we've got two more questions if we could maybe cover them in the next five minutes does that sound all right uh, and we'll go on to Maureen Hi, um, another one from Teesside. <laughs> We're all doing it today. Um, just on the question of um, council, we have um, a borough with a number of um, parish and town councils within it. S some of those parish and town councils are much more likely to be actively supportive than the borough council is which will pass a resolution, I'm quite sure, but will not actually do very much. Is there a way of putting the information about a number of different councils into that form, or is it only one? To be honest with you, Maureen, I'm just checking that as you were asking. <laughs> but um, you can, when you're under local authority, there's a drop down. So you can yeah. you can tell us about county council, district county, unitary authority, metropolitan district, London borough, town council, parish council, or other. Um, and you should be able to put multiple there, but I'm not 100 percent sure. So I might have to look into that and get back to you if that's OK. Yeah, that that's great. Thank you very much. Thank, yeah, and thanks for highlighting because I know some people are maybe on different boundaries and are across a couple of different parishes. So that's definitely something that we want to capture. Um, I know that we can definitely put more than one uh, member of parliament if you're across areas, but I just need to double check for you that the parish level we can do that as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then last hand up I've got here is Judith. 
Yes, I'm the other end of the county, country on the south coast in steamy Dorset. It's very hot here. Um, my question is, I belong to a small group and we've been going for many, many years. But because of COVID, we didn't, everything stopped. The group stopped meeting. We haven't really done very much in the last three years. And we're only just beginning to regroup and get things together. I've asked actually if we can keep our renewal until um, end of this year, which I think you will grant. But my question is, we haven't got very much to write on the looking back part of the renewal form because of COVID and the group not meeting. Is that then going to hold us back from getting renewed status? Um. Basically, we've done, a few, we've done a few things, but nothing like we used to. Yeah. Um. So, obviously, because we're not asking everyone to hit all of the areas now, we know that some people are going to have a little bit less to tell us. Yeah. Um. But also, if you feel like you're not going to be able to fill out the form, um, more than like a sentence or two, then maybe it might be good to go back to your group, get an extension, and maybe tell us what you're up to in another six months' time um oh, I see okay yeah yeah I don't know if you've got anything to add there Sarah no that's exactly it I think you know renew when you feel you're ready to renew so if you haven't done anything but you plan to do something in the future then just ask for an extension but um in terms of yeah the, the point of this really was that um we know that different people have different amounts of time and we know that different people have the different amounts of people in their groups and for those that have a lot of people and a lot of time they might do loads of different things in all five action areas. And for those that have less people and less time, they might focus on one particular area and they might just run events because that's what their capacity is. And we don't, we value all of it equally. Um, it's not a competition. It's about everybody working together for the end course. So it's really important that everyone feels that they add value to the end game. So if you want to wait until you've got more to tell us, by all means, get an extension, but don't feel like you can't be part of the community because you're doing less than somebody else. Wow. Um, it's okay. all really important. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. No problem. And then one last question with Dillis before we move on to some case studies. Oh, thank you. I, I dropped off and so I had to come back in with my hand up. Um, Dillis, call it. I'm come onto the Zoom to represent uh, a Facebook group called Fair Traders UK that I think many of your um, people will have already heard of. What happened was when Tradecraft went into administration, I suddenly realised that our group of fair traders who shared and cared for each other and helping each other out with ideas and searching for stock uh, was going to die as a Facebook group. And so we set up this new one and there's now about 300 people on that group um, who are fair traders, uh, some suppliers, and we've been working toward, with the suppliers a lot to try and help this gap in the market, if you like, for a lot of the producers. Um, and to encourage sales and the producers have been, uh, the suppliers have been absolutely amazing and developing uh, various things for us, you know, sort of to help us. What I, I've come on for is a to raise the awareness that that is a, a universal group. It isn't a local group. It's right across the country. And would we fit in looking at becoming a fair trade community in our own right. Difficult one, I know. And it would then be which category would we go into? Um, we do uh, give advice. We do pass, well, not advice, we do pass on information to the group. Uh, group members actually share their information with us. And so we keep putting it on and it keeps building up. But I think that they as fair traders have got lost if you like and they've developed this new community that we want to hold on to and help them to survive in their own areas where they might be part of a community group or they're not part of a church group or a town group already so it, it's a caring sharing and, and seeing where we could work with fair trade foundation as well 
I don't know if anybody, anybody has any thoughts on that. I can take this one um, and I'll try and keep it really brief because I'm sure we could sure. debate this for a really long time. No, it's, yeah, really, yeah, yeah. it's a really good question. Um, so the first thing is about becoming a group in and of yourself. We, when we started on this consultation, we asked the question about what what can what constitutes a fair trade group, and the feeling <laughs> in general coming back from campaigners was that they felt it was really important that it remained the fair trade communities remained a geographical grassroots movement. Um, right. So we have stretched it in terms of what. Uh, activity within that movement might look like whether it's a campaign like a fair trade campaign specific group that have come together through fair trade one word um <laughs> at, at, you know as part of sort of like reading about what the foundation does and, and being created that way or whether you're an existing like local community group that wants to take on and be the voice of fair trade locally we've kind of stretched it in that way but yeah. at the moment it is still about doing stuff grassroots locally and geographically so we wouldn't at the moment be looking to kind of award a status to an online group um because i don't think that this uh this works in that way at the moment having said that i definitely think it's something we can look at for the future um if it's something that campaigners tell us that they would like to see as part of the concept of fair trade communities going forward then it's certainly something we can bring in and look at but that's not currently what we're launching at the moment um the second thing that I would want to say is um, all of these groups are really helpful. And I think under the uh, area of fair trade um, influencing, so the, that area, um, if people either in groups or as individuals want to influence people to buy fair trade digitally, and that's something they're particularly interested in, then that's something that they can do through this group and through getting in contact with you and being part of that facebook group so it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that people can't um to take part in this kind of activity just because it's not the group isn't you know that that group isn't awarded as a fair trade community if that makes sense yeah absolutely thank you i i do appreciate it i i think just on the back of all of it i think one of the things that is drastically missing after tradecraft went under is the marketing material for stallholders and so we need to investigate that and how we can help those people and i'm sure you'll be able to help us with some of that absolutely um and yeah fair trade stalls people selling fair trade locally at local level in their communities um it's still something we're really supporting and i know with the closure of tradecraft it's been really hard and yeah. there is you know we as the foundation as well are still understanding what the opportunities are we've shared as much information as we can through various emails but we will continually look at that look at what's happening in transform trade etc cetera, etc cetera, and bring you as much yeah. new info as we can when we have it um so it's still very much a part of what we're encouraging that's lovely thank you very much indeed and uh, good luck and nice to be involved Thank you so much. Thank Sarah, you. back to you for case studies. Yes, um, those questions are actually all really good because they were things that I was hoping that people would ask us and we could share with everyone. So thank you so much for everyone pitching in there. I'm going to do a really quick five minutes um, just to show you some new case studies that we've got. And then um, we will have 15 minutes in breakout areas where you'll get a chance to just chat to other campaigners about um what you've been up to ask questions how people are getting restarted again maybe swap email addresses with a few people so um but before we get to that i just really want to do this five minutes of giving you just some really lovely stories of what other campaigners have been up to over the last six months or so um so we have been working on updating our website. One of the things that came out of our consultation is that some of the pages were quite old. Um, some of them were a little bit confusing to navigate around. So this is a bit of an ongoing thing that we're going to be, uh, we've started cleaning up and we're going to be doing a little bit more to make it even easier for everyone to access the right information at the right time. Um, we've got a brand new FAQ um, page for community groups. So this has lots of questions that we get asked over email a lot. So how to sign up to the platform, how to reset your password, etc. Um, and also when you email our inbox, um, that will be on your auto reply as well. So if you email us, you can, you'll get that back to have a little look through to see if that can help you before we get to you. 
And then also we've got these 10 new case studies. Um, and as I'm telling you this, um, it is sort of half live on the website. So please bear with us. Um, if you've given us a case study and it's not quite up there yet, or, your, or the picture's not quite up there yet, um, we're aiming to work on this over the sort of next week or so. But I still want to tell you some of the really lovely stories that we've got um, just to share with you. So these case studies span the five action areas that Sarah went through earlier. And we're hoping that um, in sharing these, it'll give some inspiration and some uh, out of the box ideas for people to get involved in these different action areas. Um, so the first one is uh, Fair Trade Jersey. Um, under the action area of um, fair trade ambassadors, did a mass bike ride in fair trade banana co um, costumes around the island of Jersey, uh, taking place during Fortnite this year and promoting choosing fair trade. So that's just a really joyful uh, experience and the picture there to go along. Um, John and the next one, boosting fair trade. This is a place of worship. John and Mary, who I think I saw on the call earlier. So hi guys, if you're there. Um, they've got um, they have the Bread of Life Center in Hackney, which is um, a church, and they have a really lovely shop inside, um, which has loads of huge variety of fair trade products that they sell to the local community. And I know they're also looking to connect with other people around London um, in selling a lot of their products. Um, so on our website, there should be contact details as well, how to get in, in touch with these different people so you can reach out and really speak to them if any of these case studies um, really interest you. Because I know John and Mary really want to make those connections. So that's one that we've got up there. Um, this next one's really lovely as well. So St. Peter's School in Leatherhead. Uh, under the Fair Trade Change Makers um, action area. They launched an after school international club um, and they ran a petition all about fair trade bananas because um, in their school, certain fruits were given out. Um, for Sorry, I was reading the chat then. Um, certain fruits were given out and they decided why are they not fair trade bananas that are given to all our classes and they launched their own petition and got 6,565 signatures um, to change the school fruit and vegetable scheme to be fair trade bananas. Um, and that's a really lovely picture of them visiting our fair trade fortnight pop up this year as well um, to come and tell everyone about their amazing petition. Uh, next slide. Um, this next one, oh yeah, connecting fair trade. So fair trade Harrow, um, Fairtrade London and Middlesex University all got together during uh, Fortnite and had a debate all about fair trade and how fair trade contributes to broad issues of social and environmental justice. And there's a really nice screenshot of the debate as well. Um, I know um, someone mentioned earlier about universities and how to get involved and connect. Um, and so this is a really nice case study as well. Um, next one is Fairtrade Belden who under Boosting Fair Trade have been congratulating their local businesses who stock, sell and support fair trade. And this is a really lovely picture of a local florist, Emma, who has been acknowledged for making the fair trade switch in her stall. Um, really lovely case study, that one. And then the last one I'm going to share with you right now um, is Fair Trade Ambassador. So under the University of Surrey, the, a student named Abdullah Salam set up a fair trade campaign group in his local university. Um, all um, He really, really wanted to do fair trade campaigning, didn't know where to start, and he found linking up with his local community of fair trade task field, he was able to bring university students into fair trade campaigning, which is a really exciting um, way to tell peers all about fair trade and fair trade campaigns. So that was a really quick um, whistle stop tour of um, some really lovely campaigns. Keep an eye out on our web page. Um, some of them are up at the moment, but we are doing just a little bit of um, polishing around them. So bear with us for the next couple of days. And thank you to everybody who's contributed to those case studies. We're gonna keep adding to them as they come in through the applications and through the badges applications. Um, so thank you to everyone. Um, and if anyone wants to hang around now for the next 20 minutes, we are going to go into um, into breakout rooms and we're going to just have a little chat about, I've got some key questions on the next page. Sorry, Sam. 
So um, just a few things to consider when you're in these groups. Did you understand how to access and use all of these new community updates? Is there anything else that you think you might need to, um, to support you to use these updates? Um, and is there any outstanding questions we want to bring back to the main room? Um, so I was just going to quickly ask, sorry, Sarah, while you were while you were presenting that last bit, I just noticed there were quite a lot of people leaving and we took quite a lot of questions in the last bit. So for those that are still here and there is still quite a few of you, there's about just over 50 of you. Um, do people want to go into breakout rooms or do you feel like you got enough from the Q&A that we've already done because I'm conscious it's, you know, it's 10 past seven and people are giving up their evening to be here. So if if people are kind of ready to leave now and feel like they've had <laughs> they've had the opportunity to ask their questions, then, like I said, we will run another one of these in the not too distant future for you to have had a look at everything that we've shared today and come back with any extra questions, as well as you obviously being able to email us at hello at Fair Trade. Uh, dot uk if you do have any questions in the meantime but perhaps um i don't know how to do this but yeah thank you maureen for diving in there um could people maybe just sort of put i'm going or yes would baddie breakout rooms just really quickly for those of you that are still here so we can get a sense of whether because i don't want to sort of open the rooms if actually you're all ready to go off and have your dinner um <laughs> okay judith okay going with thank you lots to think about okay so I think Sarah I think maybe we'll close it for now I feel like it's it's been quite a long session um and it looks like a lot of people are sort of ready to go for the evening so why don't we close this for now people have a lot of reading <laughs> to do <laughs> hopefully this has been really really helpful for you all um and we're always at the end of that email address if you have any questions um and we know that it's going to take a while for everyone to get their head around this. It's, it's not anything that's radically new, but it's a slightly different way of approaching things. So just know that the team is always here to support you. Um, and we're very flexible with renewals, et cetera, so that you have time to kind of embed this into your local groups and start thinking about what it looks like for you. So, um, and yeah, very specific questions. <laughs> I'm sure they would interest others, Christine. You'd be very surprised, but yes, drop your questions to us on email. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, and thank you all for being here. Thank you to the team for putting this together. Thanks to Sam for being an expert screen sharer and for Stefan and Elena who've been monitoring all of the questions in the chat. So we look forward to the next one of these and seeing you all really soon. So take care and enjoy your evenings. Thank you. Thank well, you. Have a nice evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.